So, you can see the title of today's talk, Who Are We? and Why We Worship Krishna. And so this is a question I get asked a lot. I mean, I'm not asking myself the question, I know who I am. Humble Mazmi. Anyway, more than that. is a little boy, and it's Krishna. I'm a general servant of Krishna, I know that. But people ask me, who are you? And I say, where were the Hare Krishnas? They say, what's that? Uh, and why do you worship that Christian person? 
So we're going to describe the answers that I get. But first, I thought, you know, I'd do a little research. You know, usually I answer people, you know, it's a branch of Hinduism. Because they don't relate to anything else. And, you know, we got, because people want to understand how big we are. You know, if people think it's just a small little cult, you know, we just got 10 people worshiping Krishna, I'm in trouble. Because <laughs> I make a big program at that point. So instead, we say, well, there's over 1 billion people. I said, wow, say, why have I never heard about it? Well, you haven't left America. You haven't gone to the university. Anyway, so, so I wanted to see what the legal definition of Hinduism was. And I couldn't find any except in something called the Hindu Marriage Act in the Indian Constitution. So not that I'm planning on that. You know, the sannyasi, the sannyasi shouldn't get married. So anyway, so uh, it says, and it's a little longer that, to any person who is a Hindu by religion and any of the forms or developments, including Virashaiva, Lingayat, or a follower of the Brahma, Partana, or Arya Samaj, and also it does include later on the Buddhists and the Jains and the Sikhs. So that's pretty, in, pretty good, uh, inclusive, isn't it? Pretty much everybody who is a Muslim or a Christian, or if there's some Jewish people happen to be, and then there are, actually there are some old Jewish temples there. So, so then I looked into the uh, Vedas, and the ancient scriptures, which actually contain the absolute truth, uh, we believe in the descending process that actually knowledge descends. Descends means that the perfect source of knowledge is coming from the perfect person who is a better perfect person than God, Krishna. And so we understand there's a descending succession, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. So is there any mention of this word in the Vedas? And so, you know, we went through all the different Sanskrit designations. You know, I don't expect you to read them all as I'm talking here. And uh, we found out that Sanskrit is actually the origin of all the different languages. Uh, trying to understand the derivation of the word Hindu. Where does it come from in Sanskrit? But the words are pronounced differently. Uh, for example, ancient Persian is a dialect of Sanskrit. This may be interesting to all of you. And the words are pronounced differently. For example, there's a Sindhu river. This is where Hindu comes from. And the Persians, somehow or other, they pronounced S as H. So it became Hindu, originally. So it was a geographical designation. So they considered that anyone who lived on the other side, that's the Sindhu River. And that goes through Pakistan, because previously Pakistan used to be part of India before the partition. So anyone who was on the other side was Hindu. Here's a beautiful picture of the Sindhu River. It is a, quite a beautiful river. And, and the Greeks had another pronunciation problem. <laughs> you know, people with all these pronunciation problems. In Sanskrit, we don't have any problems. Actually, Sanskrit is very interesting. It's a very precise language. When you read David Nagri, there's only one way to pronounce a word, right, in David Nagri. But in English, there's many different ways to pronounce the same word, just like I don't know if I should use this example, but there was one devotee today who wanted to go swimming, and he has goggles. You want goggles? But he did not, he is from another country, and he said, I have Googles. <laughs> and he said, I have one on my phone too. So, but Sanskrit is very nice because there's only one way to pronounce the words. So it's a very precise language. So, anyway. So in Greek, they pronounce the a, uh, S as a, a H and became, I mean, I mean, they didn't pronounce the S, they just pronounced and silently became Indus or India. That's where the word India came from. Okay, we're not gonna really get into that much. Okay, so about a thousand years ago, uh, <laughs> India was invaded by the Central Asians. And uh, you may be familiar with Mohammed of Ghazi. And it was quite a terrible invasion. And as we see here, he actually slaughtered many people. So he invaded India 17 times. 
and killed uh, millions of uh, Hindus and Buddhists. And in, uh, in fact, all together through all the different invasions that India had, even before the British, there were over 100 million in, uh, Hindus killed. I mean, it's the world's largest holocaust. You know, people talk about World War II, which is horrible, but this is the world's largest holocaust. And, and so these people, they called everybody uh, who was in India, who wasn't Muslim, as Hindu. So that's really where the term comes from. And this term was never used internally previously amongst those who were following the Vedic tradition or the Hindus. It was only an external term, and the only time it was used internally was when they were referring to themselves in terms of their invaders. You understand? So later on, and this is brought uh, forth in uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, that's why we see a picture of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who actually converted some Muslims to Krishna consciousness. And uh, anyway, as we know that in India, uh, none of the Hindus accepted the Muslim religion voluntarily. Uh, we understand that the Vedic tradition, the Vedic literatures, are so precise, so scientific, and uh, let us say so philosophical that no other literatures can compare to the Vedic literatures. So nobody got converted by reading the Bible, the Quran, or any or the Zoroaster stuff. Persian type of stuff. And so nobody got converted by that, but they were converted by force, by trickery, and by other means. So because even when the uh, Muslims invaded, the Indians still had superior technology. In fact, all the technology that you see in the Middle East or in the Muslim countries, uh, which they take credit for, was actually imported from India. Uh, whether you're talking about algebra, mathematics, even um, we have our friend Pythagoras who came up with the Pythagorean theory, also believed in reincarnation and karma and everything like that. That information came from India. You know, so India was the source of the superior technology. Unfortunately, when the British came, they had their trickery to trick people in India. Uh, you know, the railroads and things like that. And uh, many people became attracted by what they considered to be superior. It wasn't superior technology. Because the technology in the West, as we're experiencing now, is very polluting. In fact, if you've been reading about the fires in Australia and the global warming, uh, it's not really good technology. Of course, many of, many of us or many people work in the technological field, so I'm not going to really get too negative about it. I have two mobile phones myself, computer myself, so who am I to talk about it? But, uh, so that in India there were, this is a particular individual known as Max Muller. We'll talk about him in a second. So, but India always had superior uh, philosophy and the Vedas were extremely superior. And this threatens the British people and the Western people. They thought, how can people in India be philosophically superior? How can the language in India be superior to Greek or Latin, which were actually the uh, topmost languages in the Western world? Uh, and so they were feeling very insecure. So they hired these Indologists like this Mr. Max Muller, uh, uh, Sir, Sir, William, Sir William Jones, who actually stated that Sanskrit is far more sophisticated than uh, Greek or Latin. And so because the people in the Western world had this concept of racial superiority, they couldn't deal with this. They were thinking, it's too much for us. So we have to come up with something called the Aryan invasion theory. And the Aryan invasion theory was later, dis not later, but recently disproved which stated, you know, that we, the Western people, or they, the Western people, because I was probably in India at that time, <laughs> you know, a few lifetimes ago, but they, the, West, the Western people, came and they gave India Sanskrit, you know, basically. And they came up with this whole idea of an Indo-European language, which I'm not going to get into. And even 
Uh, this is Man, uh, Manir Williams, who compiled the Sanskrit dictionary. And so uh, it, that's the Aryan invasion theory, which was later disproved. Uh, and it was actually, uh, they came up with this theory based on the discovery of one skeleton in the Indus Valley. One skeleton. And they showed that that skeleton, at least the person who had the skeleton, not the skeleton was fighting, but the person who had the skeleton was fighting and they thought, well, that showed there was an invasion. That's one skeleton. So the interesting thing about archaeology, anthropology, uh, that the archaeologists and anthropologists come up with their theories based upon their own knowledge filter. In other words, they have a particular conclusion and then they adjust the data to meet that particular conclusion. Uh, I did that too in chemistry. <laughs> well, actually I came up with the right conclusion, but I adjusted my data. That's called fudging. Anyone understand that before? <laughs> Raise your hand if you did that in chemistry class. Or <laughs> one, two. Some honest people here. Yeah, I mean, obviously, who wants to go through the whole experiment? You know what the result is, you read the textbook. So just like, make your data, data fit the bell curve, right? <laughs> We're all familiar with that nice bell curve. So, but they, so they had their conclusion, and then they accept certain data based upon their conclusion. That's, you know, anthropology, archaeology, and they say, you know, civilization began in Africa and all these other different theories. Uh, and so we don't accept these theories. So anyway, so that, that was the point. The Europeans posited that the original Vedas were from uh, Europe, and, and then they decry or criticize what's called the Itihasas and Puranas. That means, Itihasa means Ramayan, Mahabharata, and Purana means things like the Shrimad Bhagavatam, Vishnu Purana, Korma Purana, different Puranas like that. So they said, no, we can only accept the original, what they call the four Vedas, and not the other ones. And of course, many Europeans were uh, enamored with specific, specifically with the Bhagavad Gita. Here you see a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was considered a, a transcendentalist, along with uh, Henry David Thoreau. Very much appreciated, and they considered the Bhagavad Gita to be their favorite book. Very, very interesting. So, uh, so this is someone who's very worried. So the intellectual, as you see, he's uh, tearing his hair out. So the, uh, in India, the intellectuals were very worried about this particular theory and this uh, of European supremacy and coming up with, the Europeans came up with the Vedas and also uh, criticism of Hinduism or criticism of those who follow the Vedic culture. So they, they want to mount a, an offensive, a counter-offensive against this particular false propaganda. So there was a group of intellectuals who actually headed this up. They were called the Bhadra Loka. I don't, I don't know if anyone's heard about this. But, and they were actually influenced by European and Christian ideas and they wanted to adjust the presentation of the Vedic literatures so it would fit into the concepts of the Christian uh, European ideas. And they didn't want to accept the Vedas as they were, especially they didn't want to uh, accept the uh, Itihasas and Puranas. Because that was very hard for the Europeans. You know, there's all these stories like you have in the Ramayan about Hanuman, flying monkey. I mean, and you know, other stories about Vishnu riding on a big bird, Garuda. So it's very hard for people with a uh, material mindset to understand these things. Although, you know, I have complete faith in this. It is actually a fact, because God can do anything, and there's so many things within this creation that we have no idea of. Even as we examine, or as the scientists examine uh, the cell, they come up with so many amazing little creatures in the cell. We talked about this in the previous class. 
that uh, everybody has these little walking things in their cell called kinesis. Have you heard about that when I was talking about it? No. They're little, little people. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want little people. But anyway, they're entities who carry different parts of the cell from one part to another. And so that, you know, that's amazing. That's even more amazing than a flying monkey. Isn't it? I mean, I mean, I've seen flying animals before, so why not fly monkeys? Anyway, so, uh, so this group of intellectuals, they wanted to sort of, sort of Europeanize the Vedic literature so the Vedic literatures would be accepted. Even uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was attracted to this. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was one of our main acharyas. He was attracted by this in the beginning until he got a copy of the Chaitanya Charitamrita at Shuman Bhagavatam, and he saw that the Itihasas and the Puranas and the Vedic and the histories of saints were actually far superior to the West, even the Western religious literature. So his faith became reinforced at that point. So, but others wanted to have a strategy to counteract the Western influence and still keep people within the Vedic what they consider to be the Vedic or the Hindu purview. So there were people like Dayananda Saraswati and Dr. Radhakrishna who came up with a strategy, and you're familiar, this is Vivekananda. And his strategy was, he thought it was important to present a unified version of Hinduism to everybody. So he thought the way that he could present a unified version of Hinduism that would be accepted by everyone, at least in the West and everyone in India, he accepted Shankara's version. Now, Shankara was one of the great Acharyas, uh, but Shankara taught something called impersonalism. He was not a personalist. Actually, internally, he was a personalist. If you hear some of his statements, especially to his disciples, like uh, when he was chastising them, he said, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Vodamate. Just worship Govinda, you fools, he said to his disciples. And uh, you can see that, and, and you see his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. They're very, you know, very personalistic. But his Sadhya Bhasha, which is a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, uh, uh, put forth an impersonalistic, uh, monistic uh, presentation. And so the reason he did this I guess I can, I can say the reason he did that. He's actually an incarnation of Lord Shiva. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to bring the Vedas back to India, and in India at that particular time, Buddhism was the most prominent understanding of, let's say, transcendentalism or religion. So he wanted to do it one step at a time. So he taught something that was basically called covered Buddhism, in order to bring people back to the Vedas, one step. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took a final step back to the original Vedic understanding. So this is the reason why in many universities you study Hinduism, you'll be taught Shankara's philosophy as the essence of Hinduism. Although under the broad umbrella of Hinduism, you have uh, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, uh, you have tantric, uh, left-handed tantric worship. You have so many other different beliefs. I mean, probably thousands or millions of different beliefs. But the two main ones are Shaivism and Vaishnavism. So let's find out what the Vedas say about these things. But of course, we understand that Hinduism is so diverse. And the interesting thing about India, which uh, differs India from the rest of the world is there was no fighting over religious beliefs. There was actually an understanding and acceptance of other people, which was actually based upon the superior intelligence of people in India. What do I mean superior intelligence? If they had some difference with someone over their religious beliefs, it was done in a philosophical way. In the West, if you differed from someone religiously, how did you deal with it? You kill them. Not only do you kill them, you probably burn their whole village, their whole city down. I mean, there's circumstances in the Western world where they wanted to kill a whole city 
So they took a body with a black plague on it and threw it over the wall. Can you imagine that? I mean, India had so much culture. Someone different from me had an argument. And if you won the argument, they surrendered to you. Pretty good. Doesn't work anymore. <laughs> but you know, at least that's the tradition. I mean, that's a very high. Every one here from India should be very proud of that tradition. Wow. Philosophical intelligence. And elsewhere in the world, it's like a bunch of gorillas. <laughs> Fighting over what you believe in. I mean, it's just like, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? So, you know, I don't believe what you believe. Okay, boom, off with your head. And, and, and in Europe, of course, you've even had uh, these witch trials. I don't know if you heard about that. Heresy. Heresy. You know, someone was heretic, or some lady looked a little different, like she combed her hair a little differently. They would consider her to be a witch. I probably shouldn't laugh at it, but actually. So we're talking about a very high culture here of acceptance of different beliefs, which is actually a real positive. Uh, and this is the West right here. I'm trying to portray it. <laughs> that, you know, if someone has a different belief, you're going to hell, you know, whatever. I mean, just unbelievable. So. It's all in one family, too. Of course, nowadays they say when you have dinner with your family, don't talk about politics, because it comes like that, too. So uh, anyway, so Vivek and I wanted to bring everyone together, a kumbaya moment. So uh, he considered unity to be the secret of success, and therefore he picked Shankaracharya's philosophy, which you mentioned before, which is Mayavad philosophy. Uh, then there were other strategies, too, such as Dayananda Saraswati, who you see here. His strategy was accept the original Vedas and reject the Puranas and Itihasas. Because the four Vedas are, let's say, more philosophical, if you include the Upanishads, of course, because there's a lot of sacrifices in the uh, Yajur Veda and the, uh, the other Vedas and other, other information, but it's more philosophical. It doesn't have all these stories that the Europeans wouldn't accept. So, his, he, so he formed what's called the Arya Samaj. And they rejected the Puranas and the Itihasas. Actually, that's where the nectar is in the Puranas and the Itihasas. I mean, I don't know what I would do without the Ramayana. Or without the Bhagavatam, you know. What would you do, you know? We just have to remain silent here or something. <laughs> Who would we do RT to? I mean, I didn't have any idea. Anyway, so you wouldn't do RT, I, obviously. You just do sacrifices. That's what they believe in. So, also there was the Brahma Samaj by Ram, uh, by Ram Mohan Roy, which had a very similar philosophy, a little bit different. I'm not going to get into the details. And uh, they actually tried to integrate the European racist theories which was to accept the Shruti without the Smriti. Shruti means four Vedas and the Upanishads. And Smriti means basically the Ikhlasas, Puranas, and the Brahman uh, literatures and other literatures like that. And that they want to have one philosophy, and therefore they try to get rid of a lot of the Vedic literatures, edit them out. Looks like a lot of the evidence is uh, given to uh, Congress nowadays. <laughs> anyway, that's a political statement. <laughs> and so they said, if you, if, wait, back to that. So if you're going to call yourself a Hindu, you have to adjust your philosophy to fit this basic, uh, impersonalistic philosophy. So, therefore, people don't really understand when we say we're Vaishnavas or even the word Sanatana Dharma, because that's a more precise definition. You know, Vaishnava means worship of Vishnu, uh, or Vishnu's expansion of Krishna and his expansions. Sanatana Dharma means the eternal function of the soul. That's really what we're interested in. And so, uh, so why do we think that our particular presentation or understanding of the Vedas is the best one? Because we're accepting the Vedas as a totality. 
not simply the original Vedas, but also the Itihasas, Puranas, the Brahman literatures, uh, Upanishads, all those other literatures. So there's many quotes we can produce, and I'm not going to belabor you with all these quotes, but here's one from the Brahma Samhita. In the original four Vedas, uh, Brahma is referred to as Prajapati. Some of you may have heard this term. Prajapati means basically the person who has prajas or children. And Brahma is one of the original Prajapatis uh, because from Lord Brahma came practically all the living entities in creation. So there's the Brahma Samhita, who taught that mentions Lord Vishnu's position, uh, specifically in relationship to Lord Shiva. It says, Shiram Yata Dada Dadi Vikara Vishesh Yogat Sanjayate Nahi Tata Patagasti Heto Sayok Sam Bhutama Vitata Sam Paiti Karyad Gomindam Ali Purisham Tamaham Bajami. Sorry, I should have skipped ahead to that. So we worship. Uh, Govinda, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and then the comparison is made there of milk being transformed into yogurt, and that's what she was position in relationship to Vishnu. And, of course, we do offer respects to all the demigods, because all the demigods are parts and parcels of Krishna. They're servants of Krishna. They're devotees of Krishna. Uh, Lord Chaitanya himself would regularly, as he went around South India, visit the demigods' temples of Lord Shiva's temples and offered respects. Uh, so this is very important. We don't respect any li disrespect, sorry, any living entity, especially those who are very powerful, like the demigods. Uh, Ved so Vedic culture, from the beginning, the original four Vedas is focused on worship of Vishnu. In fact, all the hymns in the Rig Veda begin with Om, which is actually, according to Krishna and the Gita, what Pranava Sarva Veda Vishnu. Uh, I'm the sound of Om. I'm Om in the Vedic literature, the Pranava. Uh, of course, the impersonalists who follow Shankaracharya, they have other Mahavakyas, like Tatvamasi, like you are that. But according to the Vedas themselves, Om is the uh, primary sound of the Vedic literatures. And then you have other statements in the Rig Veda, such as Om Tat Vishnu Parmam Pada Pashanti Yatsuriya, which indicates that all the demigods are looking to Lord Vishnu. And in the Yajur Veda, you have Yajya Vai Vishnu, that Yajya is always Vishnu, and, or Vishnu is the, and Vishnu is the highest god. In the Brahminical literature, uh, there's a commentary, which is a commentary on the Vedas in Atareya Brahmana. It says Vishnu is the highest god, the highest goal. So nowhere in the Vedas does it say to worship others as supreme over Lord Vishnu. There's no statement in the Vedas like that. And in the Chandogya Upanishad, we find reference, which is one of the oldest, most prominent Upanishads, we find reference to the Itihasas and Puranas. Itihasa Puranam, Panchama Veda, Uchate. That means the Itihasas, the histories, and the Puranas, especially the Bhagavad Purana, are known as the fifth Veda, Panchama Veda, Uchate. And in the Bhagavad Gita, we have statements that Aham Adir Devanam, from the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, that Krishna is the source of all the demigods. So you, it's very uh, easy to understand if you take the Vedas as a whole. There's even one book that uh, Islam put out a number of years ago called Readings in Vedic Literature, which discussed this point. So one of the great acharyas, that is uh, Srila Jiva Goswami, who appeared a little over 500 years ago, uh, wanted to establish this uh, position of Krishna as the ultimate uh, personality or the original personality of God from whom all others expand. So he wrote this very interesting series of books called the Shat Sandarvas. And the first Sandarva, uh, the Tatva Sandarva, which has been published by Eskan, deals with something called epistemology. Because before you can actually teach something to someone, you have to establish how you know that particular subject matter. That's, uh, epistemology means how do you know what you know? 
So this tattva sandarva establishes through uh, steps, very uh, precise philosophical steps, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is actually the ultimate conclusion of all the Vedic literature, the summation uh, of all the Vedic literature, particularly the Srimad Bhagavatam is considered a uh, commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. Just to, just to give you an indication of what I mean by that, you have the original four Vedas, Yadra, Sama, Atara, Veda, and the uh, Upanishads are considered commentaries on those four Vedas. And then on the four Vedas, uh, uh, then on the uh, Upanishads, the commentary is considered to be the Vedanta Sutra, written by Shri Vyasadeva. And then the commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, at least for Gaudiya Vaishnavas, is considered to be the Srimad Bhagavatam. And for other Vaishnav groups, they also have other commentaries, but they're very much in line with the Srimad Bhagavatam, like Ramanujacharya's uh, Sri Basha, which has basically the same philosophy. So all these great Acharyas, we're talking about Ramanujacharya, uh, Vishnu Swami, Nimbarkacharya, Madhvacharya, they all came to the same conclusion. And that conclusion is uh, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. So Krishna is the source of the incarnations. Krishna is the original Vishnu Tattva. Vishnu Tattva, Tattva means like a, sometimes described as a category or as the truth or as something that is eternal that can't be changed. So. So Krishna, Vishnu Tattva means all the different expansions of Krishna. And the Bhagavatam states, Eti Chamsa Klam Sa, Krishna is to Bhagavaya Swayam. That Krishna is Bhagavan Swayam and all the other incarnations. You see the Dasha Avatars come from Krishna. And uh, this is accepted by the four basic sampradayas. That's Lord Brahma, uh, the Brahma Sampradaya, Lakshmi Sampradaya, Sri Sampradaya, uh, that is the same thing, uh, Kumara Sampradaya, and also the uh, Rudra Sampradaya, or Shiva Sampradaya. And they're modern uh, followers and preachers, Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, Vishnu Swami, and Nimbarkacharya. And that's how we understand Acharya Yam uh, Veda. We understand the Vedas through the Acharyas. As stated in the Mahabharata, this is a very conclusive statement. Tarko Pradishta Shutina Vibhina, that no one can even understand the Vedas simply by reading the Vedas, because the Vedas have many different branches for many different people in different situations. In fact, Krishna himself in the Gita says this. He says, uh, Trigunya Vishaya Veda is Trigunya Bhavarjana. He says to Arjuna, the Vedas are mainly meant, most of the Vedas are meant for people who are not yet on the spiritual path. They're subject to the three modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. But he says, Krishna says to Arjuna, Nir Dwandwo Nitrasatma Sodhir Yogic Shema you are actually meant for something higher. You're meant for the conclusion of the Vedas. Because there are many Vedic conjunctions that are not meant for us, such as offering uh, a goat to the goddess Kali once a month. I mean, you can do it if you like. And you, you're supposed to whisper into the goat's ear, Mamsa Kadati, next life, I'll be the goat. And you're going to eat me. So uh, that particular Vedic conjunction I don't suggest following, although better than something than nothing. So. So anyway, so uh, the essence of the Vedas, the cream of the Vedas, is the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, and uh, this is our quintessential literature accepted by all the great Acharyas, which teach exactly the same thing. And there's varieties of their teaching, but the conclusion is exactly the same thing. So that's who we are. We're followers of the great Acharyas. Uh, we're Vaishnavas. And we accept the conclusion of the Vedas, and that's what Vedanta means. Vedanta, unto means end, and Veda means knowledge. So the end, or conclusion of knowledge, 
is present in the Shivan Bhagavatam. And the devotees are very kind, this is an advertisement for the Shivan, uh, to dedicate their lives to distributing this knowledge to others, specifically in the distribution of Shiva Prabhupada's books, the Shivan Bhagavatam, and sets of Shivan Bhagavatam. And it says that anybody who has, I mean, this is a paid advertisement. <laughs> so anybody who has a set of the Srimad Bhagavatam in their house is keeping the Supreme Personality of God in their house and is getting all blessings continually. I mean, we all want blessings, right? Ashiva. But the Srimad Bhagavatam is always giving the Ashiva 24 hours a day if it's in your house. Wow. What better blessing could you get? Okay, so I think that's it. <laughs> So we're going to go on with the score. So thank you very much. All glories to his divine grace. Shila Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. What? Can we take a few questions? Oh, you want to take a few questions? Yeah. We're waiting for the children to come back. Oh, the children, okay. Okay, is that good? Do we have a translation of the Vedanta Sutra in Islam? Uh, no, it hasn't been done in this time. There are some English translations, but it hasn't been done in this time. And uh, there's many commentaries. There is a translation, not in this time, but Shori Raki Pasha, <laughs> if you're interested in reading it, which is Shankara's commentary. Shankara was a hidden devotee because he had a mission. In addition, we actually have two commentaries in the body of Vaishnava Sampradaya. One is the Shumad Bhagavatam, the natural commentary by the author, and the other one is called the Govinda Basha. It's an interesting story about that since he's given me more time. Thank you, Richard, for giving me more time. So, uh, the story about that is once upon a time, in Jaipur, there were the deities of Radha Govinda. Radha Govinda were originally installed by Shunarupa Goswami in Vrindavan. But Vrindavan was attacked by the Mughals. So the deities were transported to other places. Some of Jaipur, Udaipur, Atwar, different places. So Radha Govinda were there in uh, Jaipur. And some of the uh, Brahmins there, they're called Ramanandis, they got very upset seeing Krishna together with, with Radharani. And they said, we have not read about this, obviously. They didn't understand the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam doesn't directly mention Shubhanti Radharani's name. It mentions her, if one reads properly, you'll see that it mentions she who worships Krishna. Uses the same name, basically, but in a little hidden form. So they said, we don't know where this is in Shastra, and therefore you should take Radharani and put her somewhere else. I mean, pretty bad. You imagine you came here to New Goloka one day and just found Krishna on the altar without Radharani. Really bad. So they were advising the king and Jaipur. The king didn't know what to do, so he basically followed their advice. He took Radharani off the altar, put her in another temple somewhere, and they just had Govindaji on them. And if anyone's been to Jaipur, you know that the uh, temple is right in the center of the city, right by the king's palace. And every morning before going to work, the citizens in Jaipur, they come out and they chant, go Vinda, go Vinda, go Vinda. It's beautiful. And they circumambulate Radha Govinda. So, anyway, so uh, the Gaudias, the Gaudi Vaishnavas, in Vrindavan got word of this. And they called for Vishwaranath Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, who was the Acharya at that particular time. And he was too old to make the trip uh, to Jaipur because at that time the roads weren't too good. Even now, but anyway. Anyway, that's another issue. Uh, so he was too old, so he sent his disciple, Sikh disciple, Baladev Vijabhushan. He said, You should go. And Baladev Vijabhushan had a discussion and he defeated the Ramanandis, but the Ramanandis said, no, where is your commentary that actually directly mentions Radharani? 
And if you don't have a commentary, you can defeat us philosophically, but we don't accept that because the way to establish your philosophy is to actually have a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. And he said, well, Srimad Bhagavatam is, and they didn't accept that. They didn't accept Srimad Bhagavatam. I said, okay, give me a few days, I'll come up with a commentary. I mean, coming up with a commentary on a work like the Vedanta Sutra in two or three or four days, impossible. So he prayed to Govindaji, and Govindaji basically dictated what's called the Govinda Basha, the commentary, a beautiful commentary on uh, the Vedanta Sutra. And uh, he came back, presented to them, and they painted. <laughs> and they accepted him, uh, and they accepted him as their guru. And they brought right around back. So you may ask, how can the deities, this is another story, related to that. How come the deities accepted this being separated like that? Well, esoterically, when you hear about the pastimes of Radha and Krishna, sometimes there's a little argument. Because Radharani, I don't know if this is a little too esoteric for Sunday piece, but anyway, Radharani has her mod or her anger towards Krishna sometimes. And Krishna likes to enjoy the anger because everything we see here in this world is originally present in the spiritual world. Just like, I mean, for example, when I was really young, I liked to make my mother angry. It was fun. <laughs> Did any, any, anyone else ever do that with their parents? I'm sure you all did. Maybe not your father, because that was a little more dangerous. <laughs> but it's so much fun. So, anyway, so, because I'm not that acquainted with romantic affairs, being a Sanyasi. So, I would assume it's like that between a husband and wife sometimes, it's some teasing. So, Radharani, so Krishna likes to make Radharani angry sometimes. And he would say to her, uh, the name of his other girlfriend, you know, Chandravali. He said, your face is like many moons, Chandravali. And she would get angry and, anyway, there would be some separation. So that's how the Acharyas explained the separation between the deities of uh, Radharani and Govinda, that it was a pastime. And that's like an esoteric uh, explanation. So, Rishikesh, you have a question? I was just having a question about those Vedas which deals with the modes of material nature. Yeah. Do they come with the Sampra and the Sampra that is for Sampra that is, or is it something about that? Well, we accept them because they're meant for people. Let's say if someone really wants to eat meat, you know, really is into eating meat, uh, then, okay, rather than going to Walmart, then go once a month in the full moon night. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, do it. Yeah, anyway, just like Prabhupada gave the example that the, let's say if the government wanted to stop people from drinking liquor, it wouldn't work, would it? That have, well, in the, in the Prohibition time, does anyone remember that? Yeah. Anyone that old? Yeah, me. So anyway, so during Prohibition time, they made liquor illegal. And so people developed something called bathtub stills. Every bathtub had a still. You know, there was an alcohol. Even in India, that happens sometimes too. And uh, so people drank anyway. So Prophet said, when you can't stop a particular activity, at least you can regulate it to a certain extent. So there will be people in society who will do things like eating meat. So if you regulate it in such a way, at least prohibit the, the uh, killing of cows, at least if you regulate it, then it reduces it, and you're giving people a method of understanding that what they're doing is wrong. That's really important. Mamsa, the word mamsa means me killing. Imagine if you had to, let's say every time you went, not you, of course, and if someone went to buy a bed, uh, me, you would say, 
on the label there, this means, if you buy this, this means in the next life you're gonna be killed. You know, I mean, let's say there was a chicken. I'm not gonna use a cow. Let's say there was a chicken in Walmart for sale, or Kentucky Fried or whatever. <laughs> and there was a warning label, you could buy this, but this is gonna be you in the next life. I think it would reduce the amount of people buying chickens, or at least give them a warning. Like that, so the Vedas do that. They, that's why there's injunctions for people in different modes of nature. So this knowledge comes from the four sampradayas, or is it? Yeah, yeah talks about the four sampradayas <laughs> talk about the meaning of different Vedic injunctions. Prabhupada was very specific about this. You know, why is the injunction? Prabhupada would, Prabhupada actually got upset when someone said we throw away that injunction. Because we don't. All the injunctions are meant for specific circumstances. There's no part of the Vedas that has no meaning to it or is useless. It's all coming, descending from Krishna ultimately and through his various agents for the benefit of the living entities in this world. And there's living entities in different circumstances. And like I sometimes say, there's different shlokes for different folks. Shlokes refers to slokas, isn't it? So one, one man's food is another one's poison. So you know, there's different Vedic injunctions. I mean, it's like different options. I'm a sannyasi. You're a garhasta, right? So uh, there's different injunctions. You know, there's things you can do that I'm not supposed to do. That's just life. So the Vedas are like that. You know, they're different, different instructions for different people in different situations. But someone like Arjuna, Krishna said, you know, rise above that. Near jump, one world in the sattva so Be established in the self. Get above duality. Near yoga, shema, atmavad. Be established in your spiritual identity. So, Krishna is not an all or nothing person. If you can't do this, then do that. In the, in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, always think of me. He says, well, if you can't do that, then follow the rules and regulations about the yoga, right? And if you can't do that, you just be detached. You give up the fruit to your activities. And so he, Krishna goes through a whole line of different things in the 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So he doesn't want to just like throw you out completely. You know, if you can't take sannyas, you're useless. <laughs> he doesn't say that. He says, you know, just do something. Accept supremacy, the supremacy of the Vedas. And so we accept the totality of the Vedic literatures. Not just the Bhagavatam. But each part is meant for a particular people, particular circumstance. Are we ready now? Oh, one more question, all right. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think so what Prabhu was asking that these four sampradayas, yeah. they are for Vaishnava sampradayas, right? right? And they are bona fide. Yeah. So how can any of these sampradayas can deal with the Vedic aspect of eating meat or... No, that they don't teach it. That's right. They don't teach that, but they say that the Vedas are bona fide. Every aspect of the Vedas is bona fide. You know, they advocate, all the four sampradayas advocate Vaishnavism. They don't, but they, but they say if you're not able to do Vaishnavism, it's better to follow a lesser injunction. I mean, that's, the, we can't do, uh, we're not Buddhists, the Buddhists decry, it, at least originally, this is not a criticism of any Buddhists today, but uh, the Buddhists decry the Vedic literatures for a variety of reasons. I mean, one reason was the Brahmins were misusing the injunctions of the Vedic literatures. Or another reason that Prabhupada gives is that people were using the injunctions in the Vedic literatures to uh, wholesale kill animals. But we don't we don't reject those injunctions. 
We don't teach how to follow them. I don't teach. I mean, if someone comes to me and says, Maharaj, can you teach me how to offer a note to the goddess color? That's fine. Um, I don't know how to do it. And if, if they say, can you refer me to someone who knows? I don't know anybody. But I know the injunctions are there for certain personalities. Of course, we do understand in Kali Yuga there's certain things that are prohibited and offering uh, animals and sacrifices actually prohibited in Kali Yuga. So, I mean, there's all this balance, balance there. Now, the, the four Sampradayas do not teach one how to do these things, but they don't uh, state that these particular injunctions are nonsense. Yeah, that would make us, that would make a person not be good. You know, someone who rejects the Vedic literatures. We accept the Vedic literatures, but we don't advocate following certain parts of the Vedic literature. But they're not, they're not nonsense. They're actually meant for certain people in certain circumstances. Is that right? Okay, and that's interesting discussion about the Vedas. Uh, Krishna says, by all the Vedas, I am to be known. Right? So there's many, many different verses. We can quote. Okay, thank you. So, Aditya. So let's first of all thank you, Zalindu Bhikrishna Goswami Maharaj.